For almost two decades now, David Carlis and I have been drawing on arts-based methods as a way of understanding and better communicating our research. In this short film, I talk with David about a one-man play he wrote called Matthew and Me, about sexuality, same-sex attraction, and growing up in the hegemonically masculine culture of sport. The genesis, the origin of Matthew and Me, I think, was uh, when I first came across the statistic from the 2008 Olympic Games in Beijing that out of 10,708 competitors there was one out gay man, that was the math Australian diver Matthew Mitchum who I think was about 19 or 20 years old at that stage. I just found that such a compelling statistic that it led me to reflect on my own experience some more about the experience of same-sex attraction in sport at school and university and sport teams wondering really not so much why there are so few gay men in sport but rather why it becomes so difficult to be an out gay man in sport what is it about sport culture what might it be about sport culture that makes it difficult or impossible to develop a gay identity and to share that gay identity publicly but it's not a tale that i can tell you straight <laughs> <laughs> so i wanted to explore i suppose formation of a sexual identity for a person who grows up within sport culture. So someone who's immersed in sport before their sexual identity is formed. Matt lives among the silvered machines, the benches, the bars, the dumbbells, the steel. Yeah, so I think I've probably have been a bit uncomfortable with this sort of, this idea that if you're gay, you are hiding that identity from the rest of the world. That to me suggests that you're kind of born with a card saying you are gay and that you know this and that you keep it a secret until such time that you have the courage or whatever it is to, to admit that to yourself and to share that with others. Um, actually when you're born, if you're given any card about your sexuality, you're, the card says you are heterosexual, especially if you're a man in, in sport culture. It, it, from my experience and I think everyone I've ever seen is assumed to be straight because A, you're a man, and B, you're, a, you're in sport. Matt's focus is narrowed the thought he had disappeared. Stood three feet away from the shaved headed guy who's looking at Matt right in the eye. Um, hearing about Matthew Mitchell led, led me to think back on my own experience and how those experiences felt. These are experiences that in isolation. <laughs> Fight or flight? Or is there another option the physiologist suggests? The guy searches Matt's eyes for a clue, a reveal. Together for a moment, they're too scared to steal. I experienced it as isolation, but I wouldn't have labelled it as isolation at the time. And more than that, I think it's also alienation. Mm -hmm. So it becomes something that you experience thinking you're the only one, but you also experience it as shameful. Um, or I certainly did, because I assumed nobody else was feeling these feelings, and because whenever those feelings were talked about, they were talked about as a, in, in a ridiculing or a joke. Or an... But in one of many mirrors, Matt watches him still. Desire, attraction, the fear, the thrill. Um, so there were no stories about being a gay or bisexual man in sport. The only time it ever came up in conversation was as a joke or an insult. It's the story you see that maketh the man. Without a plot line, a template, a very rough plan, how can Matt ever build a self that feels like it fits? It's by connecting to others that identity exists. If you're out there, if you're listening If your heart's not wild or free Would you open the door, would you take a journey? aware 
what's been left with me of that more than anything I think is a residue of those feelings that, that separateness that in isolation that alienation that difference from everybody else is how I experienced it in my teens um, and and long afterwards at times as well I think um, so I wanted to try to give an audience an understanding of the kinds of social situations, the dynamics through which those experiences can occur, but also I wanted to try to give them a taste of the feeling of that. And the best way for me to capture a feeling is through a song. Mm -hmm. That's what I've done since mm -hmm. I was 19. To the streets, lie just the other side of that studio. Mm -hmm. burning to get out comes out through a song and sometimes those songs seem, judging by other people's responses, to have successfully handed those feelings on to someone else to feel for a moment. You know, they can turn it off. Yeah. It might only be a moment, but they get a, a sense or a taste of that feeling. So that's what a song like Mosquito for me, if I think back on writing that, I wrote that in Portugal. Um, especially in, and, and in my 20s as well at times were very isolating experiences again it was the nightclubs and it was very heterosexual the environments I was with although I may have been with another boy or another man it was generally a heterosexual boy or man or a man who behaved in a heterosexual way at least Stand up No more cheating Deceiving Move it outside these walls I suppose having those feelings resurface again and I actually targeted them at the mosquito in the room was going around buzzing around me keeping me awake or perhaps an excuse for me staying awake or a reason for why I was staying awake and I sort of addressed the sonnet to the mosquito if you like I suppose Then you go on to something like um, Suburban Black, Suburban Blue. That's a really different type of song for me. Mm. Can you just talk, talk a little bit about how that came to be? Well, Suburban Black and Suburban Blue was the first song I ever heard that is explicitly written by a man about a, a, a sexual romantic relationship with another man. I, at that point I had not heard a single other song that was unambiguously in the first person a love song or a relationship song about another person of the same sex. I've heard women sing those songs about other women but there wasn't a single uh, male song about that. concerted effort then for you to write that or did it just come about in a different way? I, you know, I, I think in a, there isn't a narrative template to use the sort of theoretical term in songwriting mm -hmm. to write about in the first person as a man about your love or desire or attraction for another man. They, they don't exist. I've got one song, John Grant's Caramel from um, 
his first album, The Queen, or something or other album. And that, even on that album, which he's unambiguously open about his sexuality, I think that's the only song in which he talks in the first person about explicitly another man. Avoid the blood football fans falling out of bars with angry souls. <coughs> Is it a loss that turned them sour? The section of events in the song happened when I was just out with my partner at the time. Um, so that's a wonderful thing to be able to be out and open in the in your city, but it was tempered by then you suddenly you, you're out and open. You're well, you're seen now. Yes. You're not passing a straight anymore, and that's no. I don't think it's any coincidence that more homophobic attacks um, happen in London. Than other cities, it's not because London's more homophobic than other cities, it's because more people display their sexuality, more men display their sexuality openly in London. <laughs> so, you know, if you pass a straight, then why would you be attacked? But if you're patently obviously not, then that gives people homophobic people a reason to abuse you, potentially.